organizers and all the staff. Um, it's great to be back. Okay, so I'm going to talk uh, about uh, renormalized volume. And the first part I'm going to start by trying not to talk about renormalized volume and trying to avoid the definition to sort of make it um, sort of more presentable. So but what's the object? So the object I'm going to talk about is we're going to have M is going to be um, the quotient of hyperbolic space by gamma, or gamma is going to be a discrete subgroup of the isometries of H3. So this is, this is going to be uh, our object. And so um, I'll put some qualifiers here uh, in a bit. But first, so there's a few geometric objects I want to describe. And the first is um, the limit set, L of gamma, which is you take the group gamma, and you take any point, take its closure, and uh, you intersect it with the Riemann sphere. So, so I'm just thinking of hyperbolic space as being a ball with the Riemann sphere as a boundary. And so you've got some group acting, and it accumulates on the boundary. And because of the hyperbolic metric, it doesn't matter what x you take, because the, the hyperbolic metric shrinks, so you get the same limiting set. So you get some, some set on the boundary, which is, can be multiple components. It's sort of fractal-like. And so that's our first object. And the second is not the limit set, which is called the domain of discontinuity. And this is just its complement. And we, I want to talk about some spaces. So, so so this is your this is your hyperbolic three manifold. Here's its limit set and its domain of discontinuity, and then um, the boundary, the conformal boundary, is going to be equal to omega of gamma mod gamma. So this is called the conformal boundary. or the conformal structure at infinity. And we'll get to it in a little bit, but when you're dealing with um, the asymmetries of H3, which act by Mobius transformations, on the boundary, it's the, the Mobius group. It's just the, the Mobius group on the, uh, Riemann's, the Riemann sphere. And so you, any quotient this action gives you a conformal structure, and we'll see that actually the transition maps are not just conformal, they're Mobius. So they're, it's actually a stronger structure called a projective structure. So that's where the projective structures come in. And another geometric object that I've worked on for many years is the, the convex hull. So you, you look at this limit set, and then you just take this, take all the geodesics that um, join points in the limit set, in this case you'd have, and you make a convex set out of that. So you take, this is the smallest convex subset of H3 containing L of gamma at the boundary. And actually, if you, if you 
know a little bit about hyperbolic geometry, we have m many models. We have the, the ball model um, for hyperbolic space. We have the Klein model, which is just the regular disk where the geodesic planes are just Euclidean geodesic planes. So it actually, this convex hull actually corresponds to the Euclidean convex hull in, in the Klein model. So it's a very, a very natural object. And with this object, we can, um, we can take the core, which we can, because this is, L of gamma is invariant under the group, we can take the, the hull quotient with the group, and this is the convex core. So, so I'll say that M is convex co-compact if C of M is compact. And so, um, and I'm going to define Vc of M to be the volume of C of M. Such a natural object to study and might be considered some kind of renormalized volume. Um, you have this object, generically speaking, when the things we study will have infinite hyperbolic volume. The volume of this will be infinite if it's got conformal boundary. If it goes to the boundary, then it will be infinite. And so this, in some ways, chops off the ends to give you something finite. So let me give you a cartoon picture that you should have, that is, well, you sh I, I need in my mind. So you've got hyperbolic space, and it's flaring out, and the hull kind of cuts it off to make the flaring ends be, um, give you something called the core, and then sitting out at these flaring infinite volume ends, you've got boundary components. <coughs> of some um, conformal structure, and there's some topology here. And that's sort of the picture um, of of our object, and the volume is the volume of this object here. Okay, and so the conformal structure is at infinity, so if in this picture you would have at infinity, here would be the, the boundary at infinity, and this limit set would have like um, because it's got four different boundary components, it would have four flavors of, of um, it would have, say, um, it would have disks everywhere corresponding, so this would be corresponding to this, and then it would have, you know, disks corresponding to this, and I think you get the picture, and there's going to be which color did I not use, uh, the green. That's, that's sort of um, our object. And um, 
So I want to talk about this object for, for a long time. And the subject, um, when we talked about what was a natural volume for it, this was the object we talked about. And I want to sort of argue that um, in some ways that that, that object um, is, has a sort of sibling that it sort of a, is a sort of analytic sibling that is much more useful for computation. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So, what is this sibling coming from? I won't give you, I'll give you the history maybe in a little bit. Um, but I'll try and introduce it kind of using some of the theory developed by uh, sort of the er early people who did the early work in this field, uh, Schlenker, Krasnov, and Schlenker, and other people who I'll, I'll mention uh, later when I get into the details. But, um, but what, I, what you notice is that this boundary is um, inherits a projective structure. So it has a, um, so, so it's a projective structure because um, as I said, these little disks here, each of these surfaces comes from pick, pick the associated color, and then you know, some, some elements of the group permute these around, but if you, if you take the, the stabilizer of this and you take the quotient, you get this Riemann surface. But you don't just get a Riemann surface, you get quotient by Mobius transformation, so that's called a projective structure. So we want to, um, we're, we, um, we're going to parameterize this. Um, by sort of what is a standard way to parameterize a, a, a projective structure by the Schwarzschild derivative. Okay, so um, let me let me just describe that for, for some of you who are, are most of us are familiar with the Schwarzschild derivative, but. Uh, in this context, it turns out to be sort of a very natural object, and you see sort of why it's why it's an important analytic object. Okay, so so what what do, what do I uh, want to do? So so we we have X be a component of the conformal boundary. And so, um, so we have that, um, we have two ways of writing X. X is um, the unit disk quotient out by some gamma naught. So this is the uniformization. And then we have a, um, we have x is also equal to some component quotient by some subset of gamma the stabilizer. So this is just one of these disks and the stabilizer of it. But the, it's a subgroup of um, of Mobius transformations. Okay. So, so what we get is we have a map F 
from the disk gamma naught coming from uniformization. So this is a And this is um, holomorphic. And so, and, uh, um, F conjugates um, gamma naught to gamma prime. And wanna, I want to, um, so I define um, I'm going to define um, on the disk something I'm going to call phi tilde of x, so it's some lift of something that's going to descend to x. And it's going to be just the Schwarzian derivative of f. So the Schwarzian derivative of a map is... Um, We've got a holomorphic map, and the Schwarzian derivative is some function of a holomorphic map. And what is it? Um, so what, what is S of, so this is the Schwarzian derivative. So the standard thing people say is S of F of Z measures how close F is to Mobius being a Mobius transformation. At Z. So one way of doing this is that the Mobius group has, is a three-dimensional space. And so you have three parameters to play with. So there is a unique Mobius transformation that matches F up to its two-jet. So its value, its first derivative, and its second derivative. And so if you take that map, that's your Mobius, uh, your oscillating Mobius transformation. That's the Mobius transformation that, um, now if you pre-compose that F with that map, you get, you look at the next term and that's what tells you how far you are off of Mobius. So let me just say that. So, so, so we look at the, the limit as z goes to z0 of h after f of z, um, minus z0 over z minus z0 cubed. So there's a, um, sort of a, there exists a unique h mobius such that this is finite. Okay, that's another way, and, uh, and this finite limit is, the finite limit is, turns out to be S of F of zero, zero over six. And, okay, so that's what it is, um, and that's just what I said. You, you imagine, how would you make this, if you clear out the Taylor series, for the first three, term, two, first three terms using the, the parameters of the Mobius group, um, uh, you're, you, you, will, um, you will get what the H that makes that finite. There's a, a formula, so the, the, the issue with the short and derivative and one of the reasons why um, it, 
it, it sometimes seems to be kind of um, doesn't is not uh, used so much is that often it, it seems like the, the formula for it seems kind of somewhat unmotivated, but if you write down the formula, which you can get as the definition, it seems um, pretty um, complicated. But if, I, if you do what, what this tells you to do, or you approximate by the, the one jet, you get something called, you get the formula as the second derivative over the first derivative minus half second derivative over the first derivative of squared. And um, so that's the formula. And generally, um, it's natural to write dz squared because it actually gives you a quadratic differential on the disk. So this object here is this Schwarzian derivative, which is a quadratic differential on the disk. And what is it? It's a quadratic differential that um, is somehow telling you how far these disks are from being round disks. And a round disk in this picture would mean that that boundary component was just a geodesic plane. So, Okay, so this descends to some phi, and I'll phi sub m, and it's a quadratic differential on the conformal boundary. So thank you, Misha, uh, for your a uh, description of quadratic differentials, and that, that well, helps with this uh, introducing these things. But this, is, this it gives you a quadratic differential, and this, this object is sort of a natural analytic object that comes along with the definition of a hyperbolic manifold. Okay. So, So one thing to, to note that that um, Misha described Tychmer space today as um, and I want to say that if you look at the space of quadratic differentials on a Riemann surface. This is isomorphic to the cotangent bundle of X to Teichmer space of a surface. So you have some surface, you get some conformal structure X on it, so it's a point in Teichmer space. The space of quadratic differentials is exactly the cotangent bundle. Okay. So how, how do we go and divide, define renormalized volume? So so what I, the first thing I'm going to do is think of. So we're going to take let be n is going to be a a compact. Um, three manifold, and I'm going to take with the boundary be incompressible. That's just an, a topological condition that I'm going to need. Um, you could do it without it, for but I'd have to change some definition, some statements. So I'll just this is sufficient for our purpose. So, 
I'm going to define CC of n. What is incompressible? So there, there is no, the, it's pi 1 injective. The boundary is pi 1 injective. So in fact, the picture I drew would be misleading if that was, because if it's pi 1 injective, then all the boundary components lift to disks. Otherwise, they wouldn't be disks. They'd be topologically something else. So, so I'm going to look at the space on this. This is not a hyperbolic manifold or anything like that, but I'm going to look at the space of convex co-compact structures on this compact tree manifold. So it's going to be the set of all M, uh, which are convex co-compact structures on the interior of N. So if you recall the picture I had there, you had some flaring ends and you had, you had some, it had some underlying topological structure. That was one point, but we can imagine as we vary, uh, we could have a whole variety of uh, such hyperbolic structures. So we, we have a, a theorem Um, yes. But it's compact, so it has no boundary then, right? It's, this, this has, well, I'm just going to tell you what it, what it is as a topological space. So it's, 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 the, it's equivalent to the Teichmar space of its boundary. So yeah, so, so right, so, so we have that the, for, if the boundary of n is incompressible, Then C C of N is, is just the Teichmar space of the boundary. And the map is you send M to the conformal structure. Okay? So that's your So really, when you're looking at these objects, as long as you know the structure, the conformal structure at infinity, and you have the, you, the, the topology of the manifold is fixed, you know the interior. So, so what we have is that, it's, so, Therefore, the projective structure on uh, on this gives a one form on CC of N, where you have a At M, this one form is a phi M, which is an element of So this is, so we now, we've used a projective structure to define a, um, a one form. Okie dokie. So what's the point? So, so VC, the convex core volume, is a function from uh, It's a volume of an object, so it's a function from, uh, from sorry, this is supposed to be CC, CC of N. So I take my M, I take its core, I take its volume. So I get a number. And so there's an alternate
analytical object called VOR, renormalized volume. And a priori, it's just into OR. And this is a um, And, uh, 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 and interpreted <coughs> by Krasnov and Schlenker. Now I may have time to get into the details of it. Um, Graham and Witten describe a way to take a Einstein manifold that is conformally compact, i.e. there is a conformal structure at infinity, and using that conformal structure to um, remove a neighborhood of the flaring ends and get a finite volume. So that's where it comes from. Do I understand already? What? For, for which Einstein manifold? Any Richard Flat or any negative? I think it's... Um, I don't know if it was all a negative, negative curved Einstein manifolds or just Einstein manifolds, I'm not sure. Okay, conformally compact Einstein manifolds, I think. Uh, I thought what I said, conformally compact? Yeah, the, the conformally compact ones, we, the, the conformal boundary conformally compactifies it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's it. So yeah. So it's a. So after studying these objects for a long time, and working with convex holes and convex cores, and myself and Dick did a lot of work on these, and um, this renormalized volume was much more as a more recent phenomenon, but it, in some ways. It allows you to, uh, to tackle hyperbolic um, studying these objects which with, with a little bit of um, some analytic tools. This volume here is continuous, but it doesn't have differential properties that are particularly nice. Um, so so it, it, it doesn't lend itself to analysis. This does. And these two seem to, uh, as I'll hopefully describe, they sort of track each other. Okay, so here's um, Krasnov and Schlenker. Um, proved the following. They said um, the differential of renormalized volume is some um, one form, a real one form. And it's just a real part of phi. So, so if, if you want to think of this in terms of, um, if you're, if you take a tangent vector, which is a Beltrami differential, <coughs> this is just equal to the real part of um, the real part of the pairing between this complex one form and this Beltrami differential. So what I'd like to do before, if, if I have time when we see how much time I have in the talk, to talk about renormalized volume, I, the description of it is very beautiful and it's a lot of 
it has a, it's very elegant and, but um, maybe if we want to talk about some results, this, this is sufficient to tell you that if this is true, there's only one renormalized vo volume function up to a constant. So we, we know the function up to a constant with its theorem, even though that's, this is sort of a reverse way of looking at it. And if we have a, if we're in a situation where our manifold has all its boundaries being geodesic, like a Fuchsian manifold, then the volumes of it and the convex core agree. And so, so that's uh, sufficient to nail down that constant. So in particular, in the, in for quasi-Fuchsian space, for those people, with this and, and the fact that the renormalized volume is zero on the Fuchsian locus defines it. Okay. So, okay. So, so the first fact and was originally due to the um, Krasnov Schlenker in the um, quasi Fuchsian case and then me and Dick, sort of, in studying things with compressible boundary, um, sort of wrote down a general formula for, for with M incompressible boundary, then the volume of the core minus 10 times the Euler characteristic is less than or equal to the renormalized volume of M which is less than or equal to the volume in the core of M. So this says that the renormalized volume and the convex core volume um, are boundedly related. So, So it may be negative, but it's not that negative. It'll turn out not to be negative, but it's, it's um, the renormalized volume is not. Um, okay. What's that? The, ba the Euler characteristic of the boundary. Ah, it's 10. 10, this is 10, which looks, I should put 9.135 or something like that. It's not 10. It didn't turn out that we, <laughs> it's, it was exactly 10. Um, it's just some number, it's. But they're, they're quasi-related. But this thing varies analytically and nicely, and so um, we're going to get pretty sharp information about the convex core from the renormalized volume. Okay. So another tip of the hat to Misha, um, the vile peterson metric, metric plays a part here. So we have the, the co-metric, the co-metric says that on, um, if I'm in Teichmar space at a structure X, and I take, which is a 
quadratic differentials on this. Um, the emission in a product is the integral over x over phi, phi bar divided by rho x, where rho x is the area form, the hyperbolic area form. Okay, and so in particular, we have the norm, I'll just call it the L2 norm, but it's So, so let's, um, right. Um, so what we study is we introduce um, um, a vector field on C, C, O, N, and the, the vector field, you have to give a, a, a tangent vector every point, so at M in N, we take minus the uh, conjugate of the, this quadratic differential, divided by this. This is what's called the associated harmonic Bel Beltrami differential. If you have a quadratic differential, you can make, a, if you have quite a quadratic differential, you can make a Beltrami differential by taking this conjugate and dividing by the hyperbolic metric. And this is also, if you observe, this is just minus the Val-Peterson gradient flow of renormalized volume. It's the negative gradient of renormalized volume. And so, if we just look at what the formula says, dv, dv or applied to the vector field Vm is just minus the square of the L2 norm. So it's decreasing, renormalized volume decreases along this flow. So with that in mind, what have we done? We looked at the space of convex co-convex structures. We observed that there's a projective structure on the boundary. We took the quadratic differential associated with that, and then we took its, um, its uh, the associated Beltrami differential, the, the associated harmonic Beltrami differential, the negative of it, and we got a flow. And this flow is, by definition, the Val Peterson um, negative of the Val Peterson gradient flow of VR. So, there's, so in some ways, when you're seeing some very natural constructions where this phi, phi of m just came came with this, the things we're studying, and VR happens to be given in terms of this, in terms of differential of this. So, when we study this object, we're studying renormalized volume, whether we know what it is or not. Okay, so I want to denote some objects. So Vc of n is going to be the infimum of Vc of m over all m in Cc of n. So this, the infimum of the convex core volume and V or of n is going to be the infimum of v or of m, the same. And then finally, I'm just going to put vs of n is going to be the simplicial volume. So if you have a topological 
manifold with boundary, you can take its Gromov norm by doubling it and then halving that. So this is just half the Gromov norm of the double of n. So there's three numbers associated with a topological, hyperbolizable three-manifold. Okay. So there's a theorem of Pete Storm. It says, so delta n incompressible. Then um, Vc of n equals V s of n. And um, and the infimum is attained um, uh, Uh, if, um, oh, let me just say, put it, oh, so, so, yeah, so, um, yeah, infimum is only attained if n is acylindrical. And the un uniquely, the unique min is the M G D S where the convex core C of M G D S the boundary of it is totally G D S That can be attained here or two. N is just a surface cross an interval. This is the quasi Fuchsian case. And at um, the Fuchsian locus. So this is a combination of a couple of results of P storm. Um, so if you're acylindrical, if you're not acylindrical or Fuchs, quasi Fuchsian, then this is, it's not attained. They're equal, but they're not, it's, they're, it's not attained. If you're acylindrical, you get, a, you get a quality, you get a unique minimum at the structure that has totally geodesic boundary. And for the quasi-fuxian, the VS, this turns out to be zero. And the only things with zero volume for the core is fuxian. So, Using our flow, um, we get the same statement. Um, that, uh, yeah, did I write it? Right? Um, did I write it? Okay. That I get um, VC. V or of n is equal to V C of n is equal to V S of n. And then import this statement. So I won't write that statement out again, but in the infimum is only attained at the same place. Okay. Okie dokie. Okay. So let me um, let me describe. Uh, how this uh, 
how this how this works. So um, so the idea is that well flow v um, for um, along along flow lines, m sub t, and we make some observations. Um, so one observation is that uh, the flow exists for all time. So, um, so this flow, when you're doing a flow, you may not know whether you can continue to flow, but um, because this flow using a standard bound from complex analysis on short tuned derivatives, you can show that this flow is bounded in the Teichmuller metric, which is complete, and therefore um, you can, um, you can flow for all time, and so the, path, the time paths of a flow are infinite. So we observe that VR is bounded below. And so if, we, if we're on a path, so the change in along a path um, is that's the change in so uh, this object this integral uh, must exist because this is this is a um, finite so this means that in here, this function, um, it's bounded below by that 10 times the order characteristic. So this means that this function inside must, um, must go to zero. So we can extract What? This delta is not such. Uh, what is this delta? Delta VR? Oh, delta VR is, 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 so I start a flow line. So imagine I have a flow line MT from, um, you know, and I, I flow from M naught, right? So this is going to be, so we're flowing, so, um, what we're going to have is the volume, the renormalized volume of M naught, and uh, minus the renormalized volume of M T. This is going to be the it's going to be the limit of that into. Now this is bound below. So this thing is going to be finite. So the delta is variation or Laplacian? It's not the Laplacian. It's a, it's a delta. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the change in VR. Sorry. Variation. variation. Yeah. The change from the start to the finish. So this, this, this form. It's just this. OK? So this must be um, finite. So this a time we can extract where The square goes to zero, it goes to zero, it doesn't matter. Okay. And so there's a, a lemma we prove, and it says that rather than this, this number 10, 
you have a function of the L2 norm times the Euler characteristic of the boundary is less than equal to VR is less than equal to VC of M. So the pinching constant depends on the L2 norm. So as this T, this L2 norm goes to zero, this implies that the limit as T as I goes to infinity of V or of M T I is equal to the limit as I goes to infinity of V C of M T I. So, so in particular, so you start at some renormalized volume, you go down, and the limiting value you get to is also a value that you can get to by taking a convex core. So this says, this implies VC of N is less than equal to V, v or of N. Because any limit you get, yeah, any V or of M is, well, the starting point, V or of M naught, is bigger than V or of the limit, which is equal to a limit of a VC. So you get that. And the other inequality follows from taking imps of both sides of this gives you the other side. So they're pinched and they're equal in the limit. And then we, uh, we just, as I plugged in P, we just plug in P because the rest of it follows from P stuff. Okay. So, any questions? So one of the early reasons for, apart from when, when we normalized volume first arose, was um, uh, work out of, coming out of work at Krasnov and um, Kojima and McShane were sh showed how you could relate um, renormalized volume you could use renormalized volume to get bounds on volumes of closed hyperbolic tree manifolds. So let me talk a little bit about that. So, 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 so we're going to consider for now. quasi-Fuchsian space of a surface, which actually is just the convex core structures on a surface cross I. So, so what's a, what's a quasi-Fuchsian structure? Well, now this is a natural uh, place to go to start thinking about tree manifolds or convex co-compact tree manifolds. You have a surface cross I, the limit set turns out to be a Jordan curve. And the boundary has two components. And so you've got some structure. You've got some surface up boundary, surface up here, x, and some surface down here, y. So can form. And then the convex core is just some chunk in here. And um, so using bears, we see that this is just 
a product of Teichmer space cross Teichmer space. So you just you give me um, two conformal structures, and there's a unique quasi Fuchsian or Kleinian group that uniformizes simultaneously uniformizes that, and that's Burer's original uh, simultaneous uniformization. So let me write Burer's here again. So, um, so what I will, I'll, if I have a pair x, y, I will say that, define that as q, x, y, as an element of q, the quasi-Fuchsian space of S. So that's what this object, is. I'll just call it q, x, y. So, um, So, so we have so what Schlenker showed was the the renormalized volume of Q of X Y was less than or equal to, and I might get the constant off by a half or something. He says the, the renormalized volume of that object was less than equal to a constant times the distance in the Weyl-Peterson metric between x and y. And so, um, so I'll, Kojima and McShane observed that that's, that's sufficient to be able to get something related to the Teichmer metric and show that if you, instead of using the Val Peterson metric, you use the, the, the Teichmer metric, you get the distance in the Teichmer metric, which is an, an error, a metric on uh, the Teichmuller. Um, so, so this was the, the L2 norm on the space of quadratic differentials. This is the, um, its co-metric is the, the L1 norm. Its metric is the infinity norm. And so this is, this is, this is just coming out of the Cauchy-Schwartz, but this is not the full extent of what they said. They, they actually, there's a reason why this turns out to be somehow more useful, is they apply this to, um, so, so, this is applied to Mapping tori. So you so if you had a map from a surface to a surface, there was a pseudo Anosov, pseudo Anosov map. Then it's mapping torus, which is S cross I mod the equi equivalent of X zero with the image. This is a hyperbolic manifold, closed hyperbolic. So it's not one of the manifolds we're thinking, it has no boundary. It's, uh, it's, got a, it's, got a, it's compact, it's got finite volume. And we have following beautiful result, which um, was observed by Kojima McShane. But 
um, but also um, by Bromberg and Brock Bromberg, who one of the one of the analytic parts of the proof required our work, and uh, so what you what you get is that the volume of a mapping torus is less than or equal to three times three pi times the Euler characteristic times the translation distance of a pseudo Nosov uh, with respect to the Teichmuller metric. And similarly, you get the same thing for the Vad Peterson metric. Where you get the translation distance of the Vad Peterson metric. So, For people, so people who are interested in closed hyperbolic manifolds, um, this is a nice application of these infinite volume objects to these finite, these closed three manifolds. And um, and in particular, this then the niceness of these constants are. Um, Well, it's, it's, it's particularly striking here that this is almost close to what you might imagine by having some product structure where you have 2 pi times the Euler characteristic being the area of, this, of the surface times the translation distance. So you have this mapping torus. And you have this pseudo Nasov. And you have a map to the surface, and it almost behaves like the volume is a product of those two things. Not quite. Okay. Um, they're not sure. Uh, I don't think they're sharp. Um, yeah, you probably can't do better than two pi for sure. Yeah. So, but um, so one thing um, and this sort of came out. Where does this come from? It comes from on peeling this manifold and seeing it as a limit of quasi Fuchsian manifolds and using the fact that renormalized volume and convex core volume are quasi related. So that's sort of the, the idea behind it. Um, but um, So it turns out, so you can, you can also get, you, so using the flow, um, V, we obtain lower bounds. that generalize work of Brock. So, um, so what do we say? We have given uh, epsilon greater than zero. There exists a C greater than zero such that if your Vile Peterson, if your Vile Peterson distance is bigger than epsilon, so you're not, then um, the renormalized volume 
is greater than or equal to C times So, so you, um, you could also put this in as a, we could put an epsilon um, parameter in here and have it as a, a, a C times this minus epsilon or something. So you have a renormalized volume, lower bound. There's no possibility of getting a lower bound in terms of the um, Teichmer because you can, you can produce examples where, um, that, that, that contradict that fact. So Vlad Peterson in some ways is more natural when you want to study sort of quasi-relation between renormalized volume and distance. And, um, and this in particular um, And um, so this gives, in particular, that the volume of a mapping torus is greater than or equal to a constant times the via Peterson translation distance, which this was proved by Brock using um, pants graphs in analysis of via Peterson metric and pants graphs. So it's a different approach to proving. A theory, an early theorem of Brock's, but we and we also more generally we can prove that the volume of the core it differs from the volume of the geodesic example for M acylindrical. I guess I should say N is an acylindrical, and then any, you look at this volume, so these core, and it's going to be greater or equal to some minus some epsilon. Okay, so you, you get some um, relationship between the vial Peterson distance to the totally geodesic object and and that, so that doesn't follow from Brock. Okay, so I'm pretty much um, out of time, but the idea on all this is that the, let the flow do the work for you, and some of the, some of the properties of the flow are just that it decreases renormalized volume, and, but then as you get into a little bit more detail, uh, studying this flow requires a little bit more of an analysis of the, um, the, the geometry of the convex core, the set of convex core structures. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much.